coming up on Pistons in Focus, presented by Chevrolet. He's widely recognized as the most talented big man in franchise history, blessed with a soft outside touch to complement his powerful inside game. Bob Lanier was a standout performer in a remarkable era for NBA centers. But his decade of dominance in Detroit yielded no championships, as a constantly shifting roster proved too tough to overcome. He now shines as one of the great ambassadors of the game, giving back to a sport that has given him so much. Bob Lanier's incredible story is up next on Pistons in Focus, presented by Chevrolet. Welcome to Pistons in Focus, where we look back at the careers of those past and present who have made the most significant contributions to Pistons history. In this episode, the focus is on Bob Lanier. Just five players who played all or the best part of their careers with the Pistons are in the Hall of Fame. They are George Yardley, Dave Bing, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, and the great Bob Lanier, the lone center of the group. Lanier was the league's top pick in 1970 out of St. Bonaventure, chosen ahead of the next three guys who'd all become Hall of Famers. And the Pistons took him even though he'd suffered a serious knee injury in the just completed NCAA tournament. I was ecstatic because we, uh, you know, he was the number one player in the country, uh, big guy, center, we needed, you know, they're hard to come by, and he was talented, but he was hurt. They had asked me to speak at uh, his senior banquet up at uh, St. Bonaventure, and here's this guy riding around in a golf cart because of the injury that he had, he couldn't walk, and uh, Bob must have been 300 plus. And I looked at him, and, you know, as talented as he was, I said, you know, it's going to be tough for you to, come up, to overcome this injury. I remember sitting in, a, in, a, in the hospital, Ed Coyle, who was the general manager, came up to the room, and we did a contract signing in the room. And that summer, I had so much uh, atrophy in my knee. And during training camp, there was a guy, Harvey Marlette, from Eastern Michigan, came into my knee and, and I went over and, and I mean it sounded like a shotgun going off, all the crunching that came through and it was the best thing that could have happened for me because it started me being able to move my knee for probably the first time. Although in hindsight I probably should have never been out there. I probably should have waited until like January of that year really worked on rehab because it caused a lot of problems on both sides of me for a large number of years. Despite the aching knee, Lanier split time with incumbent center Otto Moore as a rookie in 71, averaging nearly 16 points a game and eight rebounds. Bob was a student of the game. I mean, he understood the, the small nuances of the game. You know, everybody looked at him uh, as just this big body, but I mean, he could shoot the, the 18, 20 footer as well as any guard. He had a hook shot. Nobody but Kareem had a hook shot like him. I mean, he could do anything that he wanted to do. Freakishly skilled for one so large, possessing such a deft touch from the outside, he also boasted freakishly large feet the required size 22 shoes, biggest in the NBA. I was somewhere. I don't know where I was. And the guy, I read these big old headlines. Lanier's feet came in to, <laughs> to the to the gym at 7.45 and Lanier got there at 8.30. <laughs> well, that hurt me to my heart, man. I was crying. I mean, I was laughing and crying at the same time. Lanier raised the scoring average to 25.7 in 72, a sophomore season. In 73, he averaged 15 rebounds, and in 74, the team won 52 games, its best season since moving to Detroit in 57. And that year, Bob was named the MVP of the All-Star Game in Seattle with 26 points and 10 rebounds and 24 minutes of play. Everything was rolling, you know, you catch it, you understood what you needed to do. It was kind of like being back on the playgrounds again in Buffalo, New York growing up. Um, but it was interesting at the end of the game because Spencer was on my team. Spencer played in Seattle. Spencer had a fairly decent maybe second half of the game or something like that. And sitting in the we come in the locker room, he's sitting right next to me. And he said, and he's talking to all these writers, I deserve to have the MVP. 
And now I got the trophy sitting right here next to me. And I was like flabbergasted. I said, <clears throat> I had to just pretend like I'm not hearing all this stuff. Unfortunately, the Pistons lost a heartbreaking series with Chicago that year when the seventh game came down to a final seconds inbounds pass that went awry. You felt you were chick you had a good enough team to win the championship oh, that year. Oh yeah. Yeah. We I mean think about it. I'm in my prime, you know. We got a, a deep squad. You know, it's not like um you got a ragamuffin squad and you're just lucky. You know, but you, when you make bad choices, then bad things happen. Bad choices, missed opportunities, and even an imminent ownership change all thwarted the Pistons' progress and potential in the years to come. If Lanier's Pistons were to become great, they'd have to continue to make improvements like the ones that had gotten them to their highest level of success in their 17 years in Detroit. Heading into the 1975 season, things looked promising for 26-year-old Bob Lanier and the Pistons. They were coming off their best season in Detroit. Dave Bing was yet to turn 31. They were led by Coach of the Year Ray Scott and were motivated to avenge the seven-game playoff defeat to the Bulls. Oh, one more thing. They also had a new ownership group led by local industrialist William Davidson, who bought the team in July. The new owner was an X-Factor, but Lanier was pretty sure he'd be an improvement over Fred Zollner, the man who sold Davidson the franchise. Mrs. Zollner came, in, came into the locker room one day. He comes around, he says hello to everybody, he gets to my, 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 my stall, and he says, uh, hey, Happy, how you doing? Happy. Good to see you, Happy. Now, Happy was traded three or four oh, years so before that. <laughs> I said, this guy here, he's just a little bit senile right now. <laughs> Everybody thought, you know, said, you know, great businessman, had a lot of money. Um, uh, everybody thought it was good, going to be good because he's a very successful guy in his own right. Unfortunately, Bing and Davidson immediately clashed when Bing demanded to be given deferred compensation before it was due. Things quickly deteriorated. In the 75 season, despite the Nears' 24 points and 12 rebounds, the team fell under 500. By mid-76, Bing had been traded to Washington, Scott had been fired, and Lanier would wind up playing for five different coaches the next five years. It was like life unfulfilled. I mean, there was, there was always constant, constant turmoil in my mind, and probably it affected my relationship with, um, damn, I can't, I don't, want, I don't want to talk about this stuff. Um, but I, I think what it does is um, it, it affects your relationship with your people that you're close to because you're, you never reach the pinnacle of where you're trying to reach, you know, it's, it was always something. Uh, even at this stage in my life, I think, God, no, what could have been? By 1980, with the team falling to 16 wins, Lanier suffered a broken finger. Also, the pairing of Lanier and just acquired Bob McAdoo failed because of McAdoo's reluctance to play. But a look to the future, new GM Jack McCloskey traded Lanier to Milwaukee for young Kent Benson. You're paying a man a, a lot of money, and they still win 16, 17 games, whatever it is. Uh, you know, you better go in a different direction. When it came down, he really was disappointed that he got traded from Detroit, you know, and I was hoping to get a chance to play with him a little more, but he had just broke his hand. So we just had a bunch of problems. But he was shocked, I think, you know, to get traded because he didn't really want to leave Detroit. The night Lanier left was gut-wrenching. He sat at the airport with his wife, Cheryl, accepting that it was the best thing for all parties, but was deeply affected nonetheless. Damn. Shoot. Sure. Hey, big fella, good luck in Milwaukee. Okay, thank you. Pain. Pain, man, uh, again, you know, because if I bled, I would bleed pissed and red. Lanier walked down the jetway with a heavy heart that night. He had given so much, but wasn't able to leave Detroit as a champion. As an athlete, you're judged by that. You're judged by, by the rings, you know, and so many of us have not gotten them. Some people make it happen, and some people like me didn't make it happen. I mean, and you got to take when you're the best player, you got to take that weight. And I can look in the mirror every day of my life and say I gave it my all. I understand that. I don't, I don't ever have to look in that mirror and say, you know what, you didn't do it that day. No, I gave it my all all the time. That I know. I worked hard. I, I prepared hard. Uh, studied hard. Studied people's games. All that kind. I did everything I could do. But 
didn't get it done. Lanier played four more seasons with Milwaukee and three games into his final year, the 83-84 season, and frustrated by Bill Lane Beer's agitating style, he punched Lane Beer to the Silver Dome floor. He knew he overreacted, dashing any hope of ever returning to the Pistons. It was the worst walk of my entire life from our bench to out that door. I mean, all them people who I thought were, had my back and they loved me, they jeered me. And people all on the thing throwing beer on you and these are supposed to be my people. That was really serious. Lanier retired in 1984 at age 36 and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 92. He trails only Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars in career piston points and a scoring average of 22.7 remains number one in club history.